The setup of today's video might sound like the beginning of the plot of a romance novel. With a bored, wealthy farmer's wife falling in love and becoming lovers with a younger farmhand, and aspects of their relationship might fit this situation very well. But this was to be a story without a happy ending for anyone involved, leading them down a path of deceit, bribery, murder and execution. It was destined to become one of the many terrible crimes that has plagued the county of Suffolk. The first of those whose lives would be turned upside down by this story is the previously mentioned farmer's wife, Margaret, although some sources claim it was Marjorie. Born with the surname Rowe in 1742, the daughter of a farmer herself, John Rowe, and his wife, Marjorie. She grew up in the Suffolk countryside of Red House Farm in the village of Blacksall. And it seems, even from a very young age, she preferred to go by the name Anne, possibly to distinguish herself more from her mother. So, this is what we will refer to her as for the rest of the video. It should come as no surprise given her humble life, little is known about her early years. But, by the age of 14, she was not living a very happy life, having lost her mother and at least two of her nine siblings. It was some point after this when she first met John Beddingfield, a fellow farmer, but this one from a very wealthy family, who ran Hill Farm near the village of Sternfield, described as a man of industry and integrity. They married on Thursday, the 3rd of July, 1759, when she was 17 and he was 24. And it was widely seen that Anne had married very well for herself and was effectively set up for life. Even getting financial backing from John's family to buy a farm for themselves in the nearby village of Sternfield. And for the first couple of years, it seemed to be a very happy and content marriage. Anne took to her gained wealth well. No longer was she expected to work around the home to keep it running, as they had their own servants for this kind of thing. No longer was she just a farmer's daughter. She was now the wife of a local employer and landowner, and this gave her a certain level of respect from the locals. The couple would also have two children together in this time frame. A daughter, Pleasance, who was christened on the 6th of June 1760, and a son called John, who was christened on the 9th of September 1761. Sadly, though, the family would return to that same church in Sternfield just two months later in that November to bury young John, just one of the near countless child deaths across the country at this time. Things had clearly begun to change between the married couple, and it's possible that the death of John might have just been the final straw that broke what love Anne still had for John. But it had become clear that she was growing bored of the relationship, and as you will see later on, there is a possibility that she was just the kind of person that once she had something, she no longer wanted it. Problems would come to a head, and Anne would make decisions that would damn them all, when an empty position of a farmhand was soon filled. This new employee was 19-year-old Richard Ring, who arrived towards the end of that September, the only living son of a family of six from near Woodbridge. So he would have been around the farm during the death of young John, and it's possible that he acted as some form of comfort towards Anne but this is unknown. What is known, though, is that within a few months of his arrival, he and Anne had become enamoured with each other, and they soon became lovers. And what had become a recurring problem with them, they were far from subtle about it, with several servants catching the pair, holding hands, kissing, and Anne sitting in his lap when John was not around. And as this affair went on, things only grew more complicated, and each time the risk of them being caught by John increased falling for each other more and more each day, and in constant worry about being discovered. It was Anne who first suggested the idea that something needed to be done with John so they could live together, and marry on the money that she was set to inherit from the will. Richard agreed, although later said he did so reluctantly. There have been very few real criminal masterminds at any point of history, especially when it comes to killing, and eventually most slip up in one way or another. Anne and Richard were far from anything you could call masterminds. From the start to its ultimate finish, their plan to do away with John was sloppy and amateur, and could easily have fallen apart at any moment. They decided that the best and most discreet way to do the deed should be through poison, but here laid a problem. As a farmhand, Richard had no reason to be anywhere near the kitchens, and given Anne's position as a well-off farmer's wife, she was not the one who was making the food for John. So Richard's brilliant plan to try and get around this 
was to try and talk a maid into adding a strange powder he offered her to the glass of rum and milk that John drank each morning. But unsurprisingly, she was not keen on doing this, and it's fortunate for her that she didn't. The strange powder was arsenic that he had got from a local pharmacy. Not to be deterred by this, Richard took his chance a short time later and poured it into a jug of cold drinking water that was waiting to be taken through to John. But in his haste, he didn't have time to stir it in and let it dissolve properly. Getting to John, ordering the water to be taken away from him, once he looked inside the jug and saw a strange white residue on the sides and floating on the surface. After this, the pair decided to look for means other than poisoning for the time being. This incredibly reckless manner was not just exclusive to Richard, though, and Anne had plenty of moments where the whole thing could have come crashing down if anyone had decided to start connecting the dots. As was normal for women of her social standing, she had a maid to help her get dressed each morning. And it was one morning while she was helped to be dressed, she let slip a rather ominous message, saying, Help me put on my earrings, but I shall not wear them for much longer, for I shall have new black ones. It will not be long before someone in this house dies, and I believe it will be your master. Somehow, nothing of these strange and very suspicious goings-on seemed to have reached John, or, if they did, he paid no attention to them. The death in the house that Anne had foreshadowed would eventually come. It was the 27th of July, 1762. John had spent the evening drinking with a neighbour, James Scarlett, the owner of a butcher shop in Saxmundham, which he had just sold a number of cattle to, and returned somewhat drunk but not totally intoxicated. Possibly he had started to get slightly suspicious that something was going on, as when he found Anne was not in their bedroom, he went looking for her. He found her in the room next door, a bedroom of one of the maids, Elizabeth Cleobald, who had joined the household around the same time as Richard. Evidently, Anne had refused to share a room with John for several days, at this point claiming it was due to weather and that Elizabeth made a very good bed warmer for her. And as you can expect from this, an argument broke out between the couple. But by ten o'clock, things had calmed down, and it seemed there was no ill will between the pair about the situation. But Anne still refused to go to bed with him, instead opting to stay in the maid's room, and John going off to their room to sleep off the evening of alcohol. In the early hours of the 28th, as the house slept, Richard crept from his room that he shared with three others, armed with a length of rope. Possibly waiting for John to be in a state like this had been the plan for the lovers for a while, and this could be why Anne had refused to share a room with him that night. Making his way silently through the house to the main bedroom, Richard would first spend 15 minutes watching John sleep in silence, trying to ready himself for what he had to do who, with rope in hand, launched his attack at his sleeping boss. John woke up almost instantly and was soon in a fight for his life. During the struggle, the bedroom curtains were even torn from their fixings. But the mix of surprise, effect of the drinks, and Richard simply being stronger, he soon overpowered John and strangled him to death. But not before the sound of the fight awoke Elizabeth, who in turn tried to awaken Anne, but was simply told to ignore it. With John dead, you might expect Richard to have made his escape as fast as possible, but no. Instead, he went to the room where Anne and Elizabeth had been sleeping, entering the room and loudly announcing to the two women, I have done for him. To which a delighted Anne responded, Then I am easy. In shock, the maid called out for John and was quickly told to be silent by Anne. Confused, Elizabeth asked what was going on, but Richard told her that he had been forced to do it, and that she better hold her tongue about what she'd heard and with that he slipped away into the darkness of the house, back to his room to act as an innocent party. Moments later the house was filled with light and noise, as the other staff, themselves awoken by the sound of the fight, came running to find out what was happening. Entering the master bedroom, they found John, on the floor next to the bed. His shirt collar had been ripped from the fight, and his neck was swollen and bruised from the rope. Word was sent to his parents who lived nearby, who were awoken to the terrible news. They wanted a surgeon to be called right away, but they were very quickly told it was far too late for that. John was already dead. A local coroner, a man named Sharpen, was summoned to give his inquest into the cause of death the following day, and it seems that he was either not very good at his job, or simply wanted to get it over and done with as soon as possible. His investigation lasted only a few minutes that morning, 
he didn't talk to anyone in the house about what they may have seen or heard, and came to the verdict of accidental death. John had simply fallen out of bed, either while drunk or from a nightmare, and strangled himself on his own bedclothes. There was no need for a criminal investigation. John was buried in Stonefield Churchyard on the 30th of July, aged 28. Anne and Richard had got away with murder. The pair's celebration would be short-lived, however. Not only did the love between them burn out incredibly quickly after the death of John, with some sources saying that within a few weeks Anne now openly despised Richard. But worse, Elizabeth the maid, who Anne was sharing the room with at the time of the murder, had been waiting for her chance to talk. After being paid for that month, she quit her position and confessed to her parents that she knew what really happened. They told her that she had to go to authorities and let them know everything. A warrant for the arrest of Anne and Richard was soon issued, and the net was closing in. Richard made no attempt to escape the law, and was still at the farm the next day when the constables came for him. But Anne was not planning to go as easily. First, she tried to bribe Elizabeth and her family with money to change their story, but when this was refused, she went on the run for two days before being caught. They were held in Ipswich Jail until the Lent Assizes on the 21st of March, 1763, when they stood trial before the Honourable Sir Richard Adams, a Baron of the Court of Exchequer. Richard pled guilty to the killing as soon as he took the stand, but said that he and Anne had never consummated their relationship until after John had died. Anne pleaded not guilty, and even had the word of the local coroner on her side, who was still trying to argue that he believed John died of natural causes. When questioned by the bruises and marks on John's neck, and the ripped collar by the judge, he responded that he did not think much about it. Any defence that could be mustered was a weak one, and the trial was not to last long. The fact that she had tried to bribe Elizabeth and her family really didn't help her either. The prosecution had a much better time at the trial, with every servant more than happy to testify about the ongoing affair and the suspicious activity, including the attempted poisonings. Anne was soon found as guilty as Richard, and the pair were both sentenced to death. Both charged with murder, but given the type of murder, one being that of a husband and the other of a master, this also carried the charge of petty treason. Richard, like so many others on this channel, was sentenced to be hanged to death, while Anne was given the far more dramatic punishment of being burnt at the stake. A common punishment for women sentenced to death at the time due to being seen as a far more dignified death than hanging, that may lead to a crowd accidentally seeing up their skirts. Both executions were carried out on the 8th of April 1763, on the heath of Rushmere St Andrews, at the time two miles outside the town of Ipswich. As normal with public executions, there was a sizeable crowd, including students from the charity school Christ Hospital, who had been given half a day off to attend. The pair were brought to the location on the Woodbridge Road by sledge, where the gallows had been built and a stake had been erected. Richard was allowed to speak to the crowd beforehand, where he warned other young men about being influenced by what he called wicked women, and spoke of the virtues of chastity. Moments later, he was taken away and hanged, after which his body was cut down and taken away to be dissected under the Murder Act of 1752 a fate at the time considered worse than death, as it would mean no churchyard would accept your remains. He was twenty years old. Anne finally admitted her part in the killing the day before her own death. She was tied to the stake to burn, but would not be forced to face the agony of the flames, as she herself was strangled to death by the executioner before the fires were lit, and her body burnt to ashes aged twenty-one. It is sometimes reported that Anne was the last woman to be burnt at the stake in England. But sadly, this is not true. Although it seems she was certainly the last in Suffolk, and from what I've been able to find, the last in wider East Anglia as well. But the title of the last goes to Mary Bailey, who was executed by the same method on the 8th of March 1784 in Winchester. Her now orphaned daughter Pleasance was taken in by her grandfather John Rowe who also inherited a good deal of the Beddingfield money to look after her, leading to her in turn inheriting thousands of pounds following his death in 1778. She would go on to marry twice, once in 1780 
and then in 1792, each time it seems keeping her former name, and largely after this disappears from history. And with this ends another video of a tragic tale from the area, where impulsive actions achieve little other than to leave three dead, a young daughter orphaned, and three families torn apart. The killings lasted in the public interest for a short time afterwards, before, like so many, now largely being forgotten. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. I apologise for the lack of video last week, work rather got on top of me. This was Anne Beddingfield and Richard Ring, star-crossed lovers and cold-blooded killers. And this was A Little Bit of History.